Welcome everyone. My name is Julianne. I'm an admissions officer here at the Stanford Graduate School of Business MBA program, and I'm thrilled to get to talk to you today, hear your questions, and most importantly, connect you with our alumni who can share their experiences about applying to the GSB, attending the GSB, and their lives after the GSB. Here's just an overview of our session today. So we're primarily spending our time with our panelists. We're going to just do a brief introduction, but we have just about an hour, just under an hour together. Um, our panelists will introduce themselves, so think of what you might want to say. I'll give a few warm-up questions, but really this session is about answering your questions. So again, thinking using the Q&A function and submitting your questions that I will read out to our panelists and they'll, they'll an answer. Um, all right, now, just to ground us a bit in the MBA experience and the Stanford experience, the Stanford experience really focuses on your journey, your aspirations, your goals, and there are many, many unique perspectives that are represented in the class. So here highlighted on the screen, just from the class of 2022, so the current students who are you know, rising to their second year, we have 89 different US educational institutions represented, 55 who are coming from non-US educational backgrounds, a um, couple of other highlights here, 9% are the first in their family to earn a four-year bachelor's degree. We've got 291 organizations represented for those you know, entering the class before their MBA. And for 436 students, they're all coming from different journeys. And today I hope we can give you the confidence as you approach the application process. It looks like most of you will be applying this upcoming year. So as you're thinking about your application, preparing the materials, um, preparing you know, the experiences you want to highlight, I hope we can give you that confidence to talk about your experiences in a way that feels authentic and real to you. So without further ado, I am going to move into our panelists. So I've got just a slide here prepared. Um, just some brief background information for each of us. Um, and so I know we've got three on the line so far. I may have one other joining us later on in the call, but um, I'd love for each of our panelists to introduce yourselves and in your own words, maybe give us a little bit of background about your journey prior to the GSB. So maybe what propelled you to pursue a, uh, an MBA from Stanford um, and maybe a little bit about your industry experience. And then I will pose some softball questions like why an MBA, why Stanford to get us started while the questions come in. So maybe we'll start, Annalise, do you wanna kick us off? And then from the side, we'll move uh, to the right. So those who are further out from the GSB experience. Sure thing, thank you for having me. Um, so my name is Annalise and my background is in um, D2C startups. I worked in operations. Um, I did that right after undergrad and I knew pretty much graduating from um, college that I would probably eventually pursue an MBA. Um, I graduated in 2011 when we were starting to use words like retail apocalypse and it seemed to me like the companies that were going to come out of that okay were going to be led by very agile and forward-thinking leaders. Um, so it was important to me to eventually really expand my, my horizons, and uh, Stanford was obviously a great place to do that. Um, and yeah, since uh, business school, I have continued to work in the startup space, but I'm now doing consulting um, with D2C startups, and I'm focusing on analytics for them. Show. Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Funcho Fawaya. I'm class also, Annalise and I are in the same class. Hi, Annalise. Um, so I started out my career, I was always in CPG, but I was in research and development, um, starting off at Procter & Gamble and then moving off to the Kellogg Company. Um, so my reason for switching was I wanted to be more in um, a business role. So more, I'm currently in marketing at Pepperidge Farm, but I wanted to be more at the forefront of a lot of decision-making strategy um, direction for the companies that I was working at. So that's primarily why I went back in, and got an MBA. Um, I've been in Pepperidge Farm for the last four years, but happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Okay, Leslie. Hi. Hey, I'm Leslie Emmons Berthe. I'm a GSB 2012. I'm so excited to be here. Um, my non traditional route to the GSB started actually, well, it started maybe a little bit more what we'd call traditional, at least back then, um, 
in investment banking. So I started out as an investment banking analyst, but then um, went over in industry. So shout out to all my retail and fashion people out there. Saw some people um, in the chat. So I worked at Ralph Lauren and Ralph Lauren um, was an amazing experience for me. I worked in FP&A there. So finance was kind of my foot in the door, but I always say that, you know, opening up Excel was sort of where the synergy st started and ended. Um, but it was amazing to work there and, and um, get to know all aspects of the business. And so, you know, why did I, I, I say that that's where I developed my passion for fashion and just so it's had such a great experience there and ultimately decided to pursue an MBA because um, I'll be honest, when I first thought about it, I didn't think that I'd necessarily need the MBA for um, you know, my next job, I think it was a deeply personal decision for me. I needed some time and I wanted to retool. I had gone to a business um, undergrad uh, school where I thought, you know, mar I wanted to go into marketing. And, and at the time for undergrad, I just wasn't, I, I thought marketing was one thing and it turns out it wasn't another. And then after four years in the workforce, I, you know, thought, well, let me go back to that marketing thing, which I thought was soft before, but it definitely is not. And so I needed some um, a means to retool and think about what I wanted to do uh, going forward and, and think about that career switch. And I thought, well, you know, an MBA might not help me immediately, but, you know, hopefully in five to 10 years when I'm looking at senior leadership positions, um, it'll help me. And I share that anecdote because it couldn't have been further from the truth, right? Like, um, my MBA has been so helpful. It's been so wonderful to me, both personally and professionally, but I don't know, having kind of a non-traditional route, that was an assumption that I made going in that ended up not being right. Um, but I'm so happy that I did ultimately decide to pursue my MBA and um, ended up getting my dream job in fashion afterwards. Um, turns out I drank a little of the Kool-Aid at the GSB and ended up going more the startup route and uh, worked in, you know, sort of a CPG retail sort of um, company for a while and now find myself in the wellness space at GoodRx. Fantastic. Thank you all for being so thorough with your motivations. I mean, that, what a clear way to state your reasons early on about thinking about the MBA. I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen so that we can see our faces uh, more prominently. And this is the portion, again, where I'd really encourage uh, those on the call to put in your questions in the Q&A function. And there's a little thumbs up where you can upload a question. So if someone else has a similar question as you, uh, please use that so it'll bump it to the top for me so I can see it more easily. Um, and we actually already have one question in, and it's coming from Catherine. And this is going to echo something I wanted to start us off with too. Question focuses around experiencing imposter syndrome and how you may have dealt with it while at the GSB. And I think another tangent to that um, that I would like to pose to the group is, were there any myths or rumors or um, you know, maybe some hesitations you may have encountered thinking about pursuing an MBA coming from an industry that maybe wasn't always nudging you in that direction or maybe trying to explain to others why you were pursuing this MBA? So whether you want to tackle the admission side of it or your experience at the GSB with the imposter syndrome, um, either facet I'd love for you to elaborate on. Um, and you don't all have to answer, but whoever this question speaks to. Yeah, I'll jump in. I'll say, you know, I, I that 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 question can be asked in a, a number of different ways or, you know, lenses on it. But my interpretation is, you know, having a non-traditional background, um, you know, coming in and, and doing the more traditional business thing. I I, I definitely had peers um, who, what do you call it? It's like poets versus quants type thing. Um, but I'll say, you know, I, I, I don't want to say no. I mean, I, I have, I still have imposter syndrome like all the time, but, um, <laughs> but, um, I would say the, the one takeaway I'll give you, I know we don't have a, a ton of time is that you're not alone. And that was my main takeaway there. Right. So it's like, you know, you are special and unique. Don't get me wrong. Um, but one of the most amazing things about my personal experience at the GSB was that there were so many special and unique people. I had this um, opportunity that I had, like, I, I'm definitely in the non-traditional background, like, category immediately, but I had sort of a finance background, so I kind of, like, was in both lanes, um, 
But you see that, you know, one of the reasons, and I know we'll probably get to this later, that I loved the GSB and why I ultimately decided to go there was because um, you can you can tailor your curriculum to, you know, what you know, or what you don't know. So like, I remember accounting, I had taken accounting class before, um, and, you know, but, but here you could take, I forget what the different levels are, but basically it's tailored to, you know, your experience. So if you've never taken an accounting class or finance, or, you know, maybe your imposter syndrome has to do with like some other aspect of it. There are tons of people who are there with you and they're there to support you. And I found that everyone was, was really supportive of each other. So you can rest assured that you're never going to be the only one. And you kind of get bonded in that, and that we all have you know, different backgrounds. And I think that's why even people, traditional, non-traditional, whatever it is, people come to the GSB because they love the diversity of backgrounds. And that's really ultimately not answering the question, but that's what really helped me stand out. You know, I wanted to do things in retail and fashion and and there were other people that I was able to also be a big fish in a small pond and people, you know, they may me, they maybe didn't come to me for, you know, accounting work. Um, but they did come to me, you know, when they were doing some sort of marketing project or um, whatever it was. Those are maybe bad examples, but everyone has something unique to offer. And I found that the GSB experience was really well-rounded. So everyone had a chance to kind of stand out. Yeah, thank you. And that we do have, like Leslie was talking about, we have several levels of um, experience, I'll say, for certain or required courses like finance, for example, some of you of your classmates will be coming in with years of experience in finance and working really in depth in that field and others will have never taken a finance class before. So we've got the basic level accelerated and advanced so that everyone is still learning and progressing, but also you're able to kind of pick up some of those skills if you haven't had it previously. And there's a couple other um, classes that follow that same trajectory. Uh, Annalise or Fluncho, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Or I can move on to other questions. Um, yeah, I'll just I totally agree with a lot of what Leslie shared. I think you do come in with this impression that you're so you, when you're coming from a non-traditional, you're pretty unique. You're coming to a class where there are a lot of people who are like consultants or from investment banking or finance. Um, but what I found is there are a lot of other people who have different experiences, like they're coming from government, public sector, um, sector. I had some classmates who had been teaching in the past, like a charter school. So you're not alone. Um, so there's that sense of that community, but then part of the imposter syndrome is this feeling of like, what is it that I'm, I uniquely bring? Um, you know, so as you're thinking through your application or when you're evaluating options, it's like, what is it that's really unique about me? Like one thing that I, I think for better or worse was great about my background was I used to make Pop-Tarts. So for those who may not be familiar, they're like these like baked pastries um, and that was my job. And that was like people lost their minds in the business school when they found that that's what I used to do for a living. Um, and it does give you a different perspective that you're, and that's the reason that you're in the class. Um, so I say like, yes, imposter syndrome a hundred percent, but keeping in mind like what makes you unique and what you're bringing to the class helps sort of balance that out. Um, same vein, and this can be a very quick answer because I do think some of this is accounted for in the admissions process, but did you ever have to feel that you needed to prove your quantitative experience when you came from a non-traditional background? So I'll say on the admissions side, there are some basic requirements. And if you if we are if we're concerned you may not have the quantitative skills, we'll let you know before you're admitted and encourage you to take a class before you come. So um, I wouldn't worry about that sense. But once you're there, for those of you, I don't know all of your majors, but if you didn't have maybe a deep quantitative knowledge, did you have to prove it once you were there? Or did you find that you were able to kind of, you know, pick up the curriculum pretty quickly and find support from your classmates? I was a history major, so I'm happy. Oh, to perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, I found that the amount of group work that there was was very helpful um, in terms of, you know, getting stuff across the finish line. Um, you know, the first, especially quarter is very um, heavy with the sort of required core classes, which can be more quantitative. Um, but again, uh, to echo what everyone said, like you are not alone. And then um, the fact that you are put in groups with people to, figure out data and decisions or accounting, um, you end up with enough of working knowledge of it. Um, and it is, it's challenging work, but it never feels like um, you're isolated as a non-traditional person who can't keep up. Um, everyone's in it together. 
That's, yeah, and so there's actually another question in a similar vein, but not about academics. Did you feel like you had to have more work experience than maybe a typical student prior to business school to make up for a CPG or retail background? I did not. Um, no. Yeah. I don't know. Work experience. Yeah. I don't. I'm trying to. I, I don't think it was really an issue. I think obviously there are, you know, younger people or people who have more work experience and it comes out in that way but I wouldn't say it was a limiting factor or something uh, when it when it came to academics yeah I would say I mean I was on the higher end I had five years of experience before I went to the GSV um, but I would say it's more about the caliber of the experiences you have and um, the breadth and the depth of those experiences versus the, the calendar length of them and also your willingness to uh, speak up and participate and, and be able to react to a case. Um, you know, occasionally there's someone who there'll be a case and strategy and like, they're like, oh, I worked at that company and good for them. But if you can still think about it critically, then you're fine. Yeah. So Annalise, could you elaborate on that? Because there's actually a question about what was it like interacting with people who came from more traditional backgrounds, like consulting or finance? Um, were there skills that you were able to bring to the table that they didn't have and vice versa? Um, you know, I'm remembering that first quarter um, where there were, it's, it's more traditional, it feels like, in the, the academic workload. Um, but then after a bit, when people get to know you and understand what your strengths are, I guarantee you someone will reach out for a coffee chat because they have this idea to like, manufacture Hawaiian shirts and they really want to know how you did it. <laughs> so, and that stuff happens all the time. Um, and then you find the retail club and or CPG groups and um, find, you know, core people who have shared experiences that way too. I love that example because a Hawaiian shirts, you're like, what? I'm selling Hawaiian shirts. How is that even? And it's like, yeah, someone might want to start a Hawaiian shirt company. And I'd say, you know, no matter what you're doing right now, and, you know, assuming you have a little bit of experience, you know, you're a practitioner of something and, you know, not to diss my, my friends. And I was a banker too, not to uh, diss my friends in finance and consulting, but like all of their experience is very outside looking in, you know, like these are the recommendations and this is, you know, the strategy, but they don't have the execution experience. And so obviously a really amazing experience, but, you know, if you're, it doesn't matter what you're doing, but you're doing something outside of that, you're actually building something and you're a practitioner, you have an expertise, no matter what it is, um, that's really, really valuable. And I wouldn't discount that. Yes, very well said. Um, so Leslie, you just mentioned recommendations. This kind of touches on um, another question here. It's open to anybody, but how did you navigate uh, your career development conversations or the application process with your managers from your pre-MBA jobs in a field that maybe it's not as common for folks to get an MBA? So was there any tension or explaining or was it you know, supportive and go ahead right from the start? Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I can, I can start. So it's not, it's not super common. So in my, before I went to business school, I was a food scientist um, at Kellogg's. So back to my point about making Pop-Tarts in the lab. Um, and so it's not pretty common. People have masters, PhDs. I think I knew somebody who had a PhD in serial chemistry. I didn't even know that was a thing. Wow. Um, so people are very much applied and, and specialized, uh, especially in the sciences. And so maybe you got one or two people who had MBAs and those were people who were VPs or very much in senior leadership within the research and development function. Um, so I think it was really because I wanted to make the switch. So totally, if you're trying to stay in this, it depends on what track you're on. If you are in a technical role and you wanna be more of a senior leader or a manager or a manager of people. Um, so my leadership obviously felt like made total sense to her because she had an MBA, but she had remained in the same function. But because my career aspirations had been more to switch over to brand management or the marketing function, that really was something that I felt that I needed to get like a broader view of, of what's happening from a business perspective, really develop my business acumen because most of my experiences had been very execution oriented, but very much focused on food development. Um, so it was definitely made sense because I showed what that transition was going to be and where I ultimately wanted to be. 
um, and had a lot of support. I didn't return to Kellogg, but there was a lot of support um, for me to do that because they could really see from a career development where I was trying to go. Yeah, I had a mixed bag, you know, I think, you know, and I luckily I had my direct manager was was very supportive of me in general. I'll be honest, you know, the, I was I was there was a lot of skepticism. I don't think it was negative per se, but like, why would you want to do that? But when they found out um, some of the schools I was applying to, they kind of got it. Um, you know, Stanford has a lot of cachet. So they're like, oh, Stanford. OK. Um, but even even then, you know, some people I'll just prepare. Some people weren't that supportive. Like, you know, I, I really I had asked someone for a recommendation and he acted like he would support me. And he, I just never heard from him again, like in that sense. Right. I would go to meetings with him. It was my boss's boss. It would have been really awesome to have a recommendation. I thought, you know, I've done extremely good work for this person. And um, it was very clear to me by the end. And then someone else said, well, you know, um, you realize if we have layoffs, you'll be the first to go. Like that was just not a helpful right uh, comment. And I kind of just took it in stride, but I had enough people in my corner who were rooting for me and who kind of got it um, that it was okay. But there was a little bit of an explanation sometimes. Thank you both for sharing that. Um, there's a lot of questions coming up now about Post GSV. So, um, could you talk about the school's resources um, for non traditional backgrounds? Um, now, I'm not sure what directions you mean, but talking about like the career search, the network, so maybe some of the opportunities. I know there's a couple questions also about clubs on campus that, you know, just looking at our website, there might not be that, some that are particularly focused on CPG or brand management. So, could you talk a little bit maybe about the resources in terms of the Career Management Center, maybe pivoting industries, as well as some of the social student clubs and organizations that may have um, supported your experience with GSB and then maybe post GSB goals as well? I can jump in. So I loved, so I kind of alluded to this saying, when I said big fish in a small pond. So, you know, you're definitely not alone. There will be at least one other person, but I was, you know, at the time my year, you know, I was all in on fashion and retail and gung ho. And I, I thought it was, I thought Stanford was an especially great place to be because things like, and this isn't, you know, you know, never say anything about other schools, but I had, I had, I remember there was like a retail truck that had come to San Francisco from a different well-known school. They were so nice and invited us. And I was the only one from um, Stanford who went and they were having elections in their retail club. And I remember it was just so competitive. Like they were so obsessed. It was so funny because my experience was out there was a retail club at Stanford, but I just kind of revived it. I, I was like, I want to run for president. And it was like, no problem whatsoever. And so it was really nice. And so there are a lot of resources, obviously, from classmates or classes or whatnot, but a, a lot of these extracurriculars and stuff, like you can use the fact that you're unique to your advantage because, you know, a different broad thing, no matter what your background is, is having that .edu address, right? Like while you're a student, you can get away with anything. So <laughs> my story with being the president of the retail club was I was, I, there were, we, I don't know if they still have the luxury track. Well, I mean, the past year has been crazy. Okay. You're shaking your head. So I went on the Lux track my first year. It was amazing. And so then I'm like, I'm president of the retail club, like signed up. So in the second year, I'm like, oh my God, I have to lead a group of my classmates to, you know, France. What am I going to do? And all of a sudden I start, I just start emailing the CEOs of like, Hermes and Louis Vuitton and Gucci. And I'm just like, hi, I'm a student at the GSB, blah, blah, blah. You wouldn't, you'd be amazed. Like I would instantly get forwarded to like their assistant or this, or like, we would love to host Stanford students here. And so I'll just say like, if you look at it through that lens, like, you know, obviously the community and everyone on campus is really supportive, but don't discount just you know being in school in general having that a dot edu they know that I don't want anything I'm not necessarily asking them for a job and you can get away a, a with a lot of different things and a lot of doors open while you're there by just being able to reach out and say like hey I'm president of this club so even if it's not like the most robust club on campus um 
you know, the affiliation and reaching out, like it'll just open up a lot of doors that will create a lot of opportunities for you in my experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I can talk from like a, a career management center, the CMC, because related to the question about imposter syndrome, I had this in my mind that even though I had been in CBG for five years before I went to the business school, it would be really hard for me to get a marketing job. So it would be really difficult for me to make the switch. Um, so I spent a lot of time in the CMC and um, one of the coaches, so they have different coaches for different industries. So there are a couple of coaches for CPG specifically. So you definitely have somebody who has experience, who knows some companies from a recruiting standpoint and knows alumni who are at these companies. Um, so I was working with a particular coach and she just really helped. Like, I think it was a lot of addressing the imposter syndrome of like, how am I supposed to get any of these jobs? Like I've never worked in marketing and I have no idea what I'm doing, but really starting to ground on what my experiences are and what are some of the connections, um, sort of the, the similar, the common threads between my past experiences and what I'm trying to do in the future. So huge amount of support for folks who are coming from traditional backgrounds to the career management center. I will say I was heading, I co-chaired the marketing club when I was there. Um, so we did have it at the time when I was in school. I know that seems like eons ago at this point, but um, you know, leading treks, um, going to visit companies in the Bay Area that had a focus on CPG. And we even hosted like a Super Bowl session where we reviewed ads um, and just talked about those experiences. But even if it's not there right now, I think back to Leslie's point, like you have the leeway, you have the freedom. That's one of the things I loved about Stanford. It's like, if it doesn't exist, you can totally create it and people will support you. Yes, very well said. If it's not there, you can you can create it or build it. Um, so we've got, again, smart career questions. Um, and actually from both sides of, of the post you experience, there are people who'd like to know, so maybe, uh, Funcho, this might be for you. How did an MBA help you grow or get your career goals within the CPG community? And then Leslie and Annalise, um, did, how did it, was it easy to pivot or make a change or kind of move into a new industry with the MBA? Um, did you feel like your background in retail or CPG were helpful in your post MBA role? So whichever order you all want to speak into, but maybe kind of that, that connection between the MBA experience and your career goals, as well as your pre-MBA experience and now your post-MBA career. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, um, I think for me, it it definitely, like as, as I was connected to what I was saying earlier, I think starting with some of the experiences you have. So even though I had been in research and development, I had a lot of exposure to, you know, I've worked cross-functionally with people from marketing, people from insights. So I already started to build sort of those connections early on. Um, and so when I moved and I started working, I had a couple marketing internships before I went to Pepperidge Farm full time. Um, I really started to lean on my prior experiences. So, you know, collaboration skills, like getting people together, building your vision were things that were already skills I had developed from my prior life. So just started there. Um, and I think you're looked on as someone who has a very unique experience. Like even today, even though I'm surrounded by people who have MBAs, I have a very different perspective from somebody who was a marketing undergrad or somebody who had worked for a, like an agency. Um, so there's something very unique about the perspective that I bring coming from a different function or just having like a different set of experiences that helps me so much because I think that's what's made me stand out um, in the past like four years of my career. So I would say, you know, it's one of a leaning on some of the past experiences that you have and not being shy about that because the, probably why they hired you is not just because you have an MBA, but because you're bringing something that's unique and interesting. But I think what I gain from the MB was more of just sort of more social, more soft. Like I always, I mean, sure you can learn about a lot of what I learned about for marketing was on the job <laughs> um, in terms of just like pulling the reports, like look, understanding what's happening from a trend perspective. I took some really awesome classes at the GSB that built our foundation, but some of the more competency things, the things you can learn on the job. But I think what I really loved about the GSB was more of those interpersonal dynamics. How are you working with people especially when you're becoming more in positions of leadership, influencing with authority or without authority, authority um, more importantly. So I think those are some things I really learned um, or developed at the GSB and continue to apply in addition to some of my like core skills 
um, from my prior life. Thank you. Um, I think my my perspective on um, translating the GSB experience is that the amount of introspection that the GSB affords you is a really special opportunity, um, and those those soft skills that that Frencher referenced. Um, and I think I've viewed my career starting with you know the MBA internship through now as sort of a series of hypotheses to test. So I came from small companies and I was like, okay, for my internship, I'll try a really big company. And then maybe that wasn't quite what I wanted. So make different changes along the way. Um, and I think it's also given me a lot of confidence to, you know, even though I don't have the .edu email address anymore to still like reach out and make those um, asks for career advice or help or, you know, I was pretty sure that I wanted to start working in analytics. So I got a couple of my classmates who have a startup to let me do a project for them and just like get some real world experience um, testing that out, even that was just a, a year ago. Um, so the the community is is really there for you. Um, there's some questions now. Actually, this should be a fun topic. Can you talk about the global experience? So your time, I think back to when your student when we were still traveling and hopefully travel will resume this upcoming year, but um, did you do a global experience and which one and what did you learn from it? I did a global experience. It was so much fun. Um, I kind of chuckled because of course you learn. It's amazing. It's an amazing addition to the GSB curriculum, but I thought learn, I had so much fun fun. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, I think just broader. So I went to, um, um, oh my God, where did I go? Th uh, Thailand in Vietnam. And then afterwards, yeah, went to Cambodia with some people, um, cause we were just not done with the travels and then ended up going to a personal wedding in India. But anyways, it was, it was amazing. And I, I, I look back on those times and those pictures and to just be in those countries and visit, you know, obviously there's the cultural aspects and whatnot, but um, also just have the opportunity to, to, to see how business is done in other countries was invaluable. It, it's not, um, I would say more on a personal level for me. I mean, um, you know, I don't on a daily basis now necessarily do business in Vietnam, but it was, it was just like a fun um educational personal experience for me and I'll just do a quick plug for just you know hopefully we'll be out of these global pandemic times soon and just how much the travel at GSB just in general meant to me and um you know the bonding that you have with your classmates and whatnot was just really awesome if you can I would just really recommend that people take advantage of that as much they as much as they can because now uh post GSB three kids in uh, getting getting that time is <laughs> I'll never get it back. So Leslie, you did a global study trip then? Yes, yeah, sorry, long-winded way. I did a global study trip. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I had a couple, so I had a global study trip before. It's, when I started, they were trying this new thing where you would do it before you even went. Sorry, there's like a plane for it. It's <laughs> right past. Yeah, we're calling those the seminars, global seminars. It happens like, I think a couple weeks before classes officially start. There it goes. Um, so. <laughs> we can still hear you. Like, circling, we'll just see if it goes away. Um, so I did a GSC to South Korea, um, to Seoul and Busan before school started. Um, and I'm just reading through some of the questions and I'm definitely like a P uh, CPG diehard. So not, I mean, there's non-traditional and there's like really non-traditional because I like didn't move at all. I like stayed in the same industry the entire time. So everything I did at the GSB was very much CPG focused. Um, so the trip to South Korea was about consumers and consumerism in Asia, um, specifically in South Korea, given like the explosion of, of consumers there and like technology and all of that. And then I had a GMIX, which is a global immersion experience, um, in which is my second internship where I worked for a company in Shanghai. Um, it was a beverage, a food and beverage company, helping them with some of their innovations. So 
again, super amazing, worked for one, um, but the, as Leslie was saying, love the experience of just working in a different country, especially an industry that I wanted to be in. And I always try to make sure I have international experiences because consumers are very different, even if you're selling the same product and just learning about working in different cultures. Like my internship in Shanghai, I didn't speak Mandarin. Um, so that was a very different cultural experience in terms of how do you get work done when you don't speak the language. But those are the things you have to be faced with the business leader in the future and how do you navigate that? So I was really grateful to be able to have those um, experiences at the GSP. Annalise, what about you? Um, so I did a GST to uh, New Zealand and then a lot of unofficial travel. And I think that my um, primary takeaway from all of that was just the quality time spent with people because, you know, each quarter is 10 weeks on campus and things just fly by and everyone's moving a million miles an hour. But then all of a sudden you're across the world, um, you know, in Morocco with Funcha and like get to hear about the Pop-Tarts. Um, <laughs> that sort of that very unique and special time with people um learning about your incredible classmates um was really just incredibly valuable yeah yeah so you've heard you've heard about several different types of global experiences there is a requirement so everyone who comes to the gsb will do some sort of global experience we have the global seminars which start right before school starts um, global study trips. So it seems like everyone did that. And those are actually typically planned by your classmates. Usually second year students will pick the location and plan out the trip. Um, and then the G-Mix is a sort of a shorter internship that you might do in an international location. And we also have partnerships um, with universities in China, um, Tsinghua University, we have an exchange program for a couple of weeks. And you know, if none of those appeal to you, there's still you know, your uh, individual research projects. So lots of ways to meet that. They have been um, sort of retooled in a virtual space. So still ways to connect um, internationally and get that global experience. But again, the hope is still to go back to travel one day. Um, I'd like to shift now as we're still talking about the experience itself. Um, there's a couple of questions about favorite classes that you may have taken at the GSB. And if you wanna think about the lens of um, how they may have helped your career, but I know one of you mentioned um, interpersonal dynamics and some of the leadership development courses. So. Uh, if there's any classes that stand out that maybe have helped you in your career um, or that were particularly useful in your industries, love to hear about that. Um, consumer behavior is one, obviously. Um, I wish that was a whole quarter long class. Unfortunately, I think it's only, it was only half a quarter when I was there. Um, but beyond that, uh, I have a very random spray of favorite classes. There was um, uh, Touchy Feely, which is interpersonal dynamics. Um, it's you know well known for a reason. It's just completely eye opening and a very unique experience. Um, understanding how how you um, relate to your to your classmates and how other people perceive you. Um, uh, Demarzo is. Um, short for uh, advanced corporate financial modeling. <laughs> um, DeMars is a professor and that's actually uh, been quite useful in my operations and analytics work. It's just a really robust um, modeling class. And while it's a little bit, can be a little intimidating, it's also just a, a safe space to, to just try something um, and, and learn a bunch. Um, and then my last favorite class, is uh, policy and politics with Keith Hennessy, who um, had worked at the White House. Um, he's incredible. And I learned much more about strategy from him um, than the actual strategy class, just understanding um, how the politics of Washington work with um, uh, just stakeholders and um, influence. And I would say, agree, um, totally agree on consumer behavior by Su Chi Huang. Um, amazing class. Like, I think I still, I, there's, I won't get into it, but there was like a class about making toilet paper black. And I still have that roll of toilet paper. Like she gave everyone in the class the roll. And I still have it because she's reminding me about being disruptive and like, who would have thought to make toilet paper black and just, just the concept of thinking differently. Um, so that's a class that sticks with me. Um, I will say another class is high performance leadership. 
um, which is, you know, sort of like touchy feely, but brought into the workplace in terms of like, how do you interact with people? How do you create a high performing team through um, creating an, a, a culture of open feedback and um, just being honest and candid. So I think that's definitely something, especially being in a function where I'm all I do is work on teams. I can't do anything by myself. Um, that's been a really, really important class that I took. I'll throw a bogey in there. I agree with everything that was said. So many amazing classes at the GSB. Um, I remember when I was on the other side on listening to a panel like this, I remember one of the panelists said, you know, I think the one of the final questions was, you know, what did you love about the GSB or how did it change you or something? And he said, you know, it's definitely made me a better uh, business person or, you know, whatever, we're there, we're, we're there to be professional and whatnot, but it's made me a better human being and husband and father in this. Um, and I thought, huh, that's a really, I won't say weird, there's no judgment, but I was like, that's an interesting thing to say, right? Like this interesting takeaway. So I'll, I'll just add in, I took a class called work and family, which is actually, was actually so transformative. Um, I got married during the GSB. Both me and my husband were in the same class, actually. So I, I uh, asked him, made him take it with me. And it's just, I, I'd say that's one of the classes that continues to pay dividends for me as well. Um, as I think, you know, now that I'm a mother and thinking about leaning into the job and what does that mean and how we manage our household and whatnot, it's just been ingrained in us. And it's something that comes up on a, on a, on a, weekly, if not daily basis for us in, in, in terms of, um, you know, how we, how the, how the professional plays in with the personal, because both are very important. And that was really transformative to me. Those are great. I've heard some new classes on this call today that haven't come up before. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, so we have, let's see, I want to be mindful of our time. We've still got about 10 minutes, so that's great. Um, there's a lot of energy and upvotes around this particular question. Um, it says, how did you leverage your unique background of coming from a non-traditional role to advocate for your own success at the GSB? I think you've touched on this in some ways, but if there's anything that comes to mind about advocacy or making sure that you were successful at the GSB, um, you can touch on that. Too. Yeah, I'd say, I mean, um, I think different ways to interpret the question, but I'd say um, part of what that meant for me was just being clear about, which I think there's another question here about prioritization and how did you make sure you were staying keeping in mind of what your goals were when you were at the GSB. I think because I was so, I knew I wanted to go back into CPG, um, it made me really focused and it made me more intentional about um, like the clubs I was going to or some of the treks that I was being on or like the global experiences I was having. Like I was certainly, and this is N of one, like not everyone is like this, but I was very much focused on um, like how, how does this help me become a better, like I guess better servant of the CPG industry when I leave the GSB and being intentional about some of the activities that I was involved in. And I certainly leave room, I considered consulting for maybe one quarter and then changed my mind. So I was that open, just open enough. Um, but I think that was sort of, and you know, people sort of knew me as being the food person. And whenever someone was like thinking to Annalise's point about coffee chat, like some people have been thinking about opening, starting food businesses and getting an understanding of like, what does it take? Um, so being really helpful in that way and just sort of speaking up in classes and sharing my experience at the companies I'd been in or just a way to um, sort of show that, you know, this is the experience I have. Um, so that's sort of how I advocated for my experience when I was there. And thank you, Funcho. Um, all right, so there's a couple questions um, and you alluded that now you can't do anything on your own. Um, so in CPG, when much of the work is cross-functional and each person brings a skill set, but the leader of that project might shift. Um, how did you consider and communicate your past leadership experiences? I'm going to add in an assumption about this question of, at the application process. So maybe when you're thinking back to when you're applying, um, how did you communicate that leadership experience um, 
throughout your application and, and maybe in your interview as well. Um, especially when you're coming from maybe a position of not a formal leadership role, as many folks who are applying from the GSBR, you may not be in a formal manager or leadership role, but still you've had leadership experiences in different ways. So thinking, asking you to think way back to when you're applying and, and maybe um, you know what you recall about those reflections as you were applying. I guess I would say lean into the uniqueness of, of your background and um, consider that leadership can look like a lot of different things. Um, and it's not necessarily, I led this team and we consulted and made a two by two and presented the project. It can be that you found insights, found new suppliers, um, brought new perspectives to your company. And, and also keep in mind that the GSB is a place to, to learn and grow into a, the leader that you want to become. Um, so I but while there's a lot that goes into the application, I wouldn't say that you need to have like founded a thing and you know completed your career already. Like know that um, there's so much still ahead of you, and and that intellectual curiosity is going to carry you a long way. It also doesn't have to be at work. I think that was great commentary. Um, also, I would also think about the extracurriculars you do. You know, you're not you're a well-rounded individual who's more than just the place you go to work five or more days a week. So what else do you do in your life where you exhibit leadership? Yeah, exactly. Like your communities that you're a part of, the activities, and even inside your own job, there might be things that are outside of your direct line of responsibility that uh, you've had influence or you've had new ideas and been able to, you know, get those going too. So yeah, thinking broadly, I think that both you have shared great advice um, as you think about the different experiences you've had. Um, Les, I think this is a question for you. You mentioned at the very beginning drinking the Kool-Aid of the startup culture. <laughs> so could you talk a little bit about, you know, with so many opportunities, how did you stay the course of your goals or how did the GSB shape those goals? Ooh, good question. Um... Let's see my, I guess it's a unique, well, it's not unique to me, but um, yeah, I would say, I think it was already mentioned on this call, but I think it was, you know, an answer to the question about, um, you know, how do you advocate for yourself? And it was a really good question. It stumped me because I thought, well, I didn't really need to advocate, but I think, you know, what was answered is really rang true to me and that, um, you know, I, I'd encourage you, right? Like, this is a big deal. We talked about leaving your position, telling your, you know, your team that you're leaving and you're going to leave the workforce and, and do this. This is a big commitment. So I think one of the things that was most helpful to me was having a plan. Ironically, I realize it's not where, like, that's ultimately not where I went, but I would say, you know, just Cliff's notes, things that I learned was the people who came in and said, you know, I don't really know what I want to do, but I'll figure it out in the next two years. Um, I want to say, at least in my friend group, 100% of the time, they had not figured it out in two years, because there's just so many pulls on your time and so many different things you're doing that, you know, so I would say that one of the things that I did was I just had, you know, like was already said, like a very clear plan. This is what I've done. This is what I want to do going forward. And it starts with the application process, right? Like I always joke that one of the best things and one of the reasons I knew I wanted to attend Stanford was because I got smarter during the application process. It was very introspective to me and um, forced me to really think about, okay, what am I doing? What do I want to do? What are the next steps that, you know, I'm going to need to go there? So that influenced, you know, the trips I took, um, it influences the classes I took, the, the clubs I joined, um, et cetera, et cetera. And my one huge caveat with that is that it can change. Like it will change. It could, it, it could be a complete 180, but at least, you know, you have that North star. So you don't feel like pulled in a million directions, right? We've talked about pulls on time and how there's no time for anything. At least if you have a North star, even if you veer and you go and you ultimately go South, whatever, um, you know, at least it, 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 it helps you just kind of keep things together. So um, you know, that's what I did. I, I think for me, if I'm just completely transparent, I say the best thing about the GSB is that I got my dream job. Like it was great. It worked out. I wanted to work in, 
Um, you know, I said I wanted to work at, you know, extreme luxury goods and I got that. I jokingly say that it just, that experience, and this is very personal to me, just ended up not being the dream I thought. By the time I got there, I realized that what I really wanted to get out of life and what I was really passionate about had changed. And, um, you know, that's okay too. So I ended up, um, you know, talking to a classmate of mine who was an investor. And I thought, you know, all that other project work I had done during school where I was working and supporting startups and writing business plans, I kind of want to do that as my career. And so um, my classmate made some introductions um, to founders in the LA area. And, you know, one of them was looking for, you know, their first marketing hire and the rest is history. And so, um, but it was really fun. Like during school, I would always say, you know, people would have all these wonderful business plans. And I'd said, well, you know, don't you, wouldn't you be happy if your business made $50 million or something like that? And I said, that's what each of these retail stores makes, you know, like I'm doing that too. I'm being entrepreneurial, which is so true, but um, you know, I, I ended up learning and pivoting and, you know, I needed all of those experiences to be part of my journey and I'm grateful for them. Yeah, that's, yeah, captures it so well. Like we will not hold you to what you say you want to do in your application. We know it'll change and you don't need to know right away. But you might have an idea, you might have a vision. Um, you might know very specifically what you want to do, but I think Leslie, you've highlighted that so well that it's going to change and shift and, you know, Funso, like you mentioned, having that focus to help you prioritize and really curate your own experience is going to be so helpful um, because who knows what will come out like you know you might be doing something totally different at the end um, so we are wrapping up now I do want to thank our panelists and also offer you the opportunity if there's anything else you'd like to add or say before we all sign off um, I'm so grateful for you for spending your time with us today and sharing your experiences um, but it will sort of end a bit abruptly so if there's any final words or pieces of advice you'd like to share with the group um, before we say goodbye I'll let you do that now Good luck. Enjoy. Good luck. All right. Well, thank you three so much again. Um, I hope for everyone on the call that this was helpful. I know we weren't able to get to all of the questions. So if there's anything that's still pressing or still top of mind, please feel free to reach out to our admissions office. Um, you know, feel free to put my name in there and it'll, your email will get to me. We'll also have plenty of other admission events throughout the summer chats with our alumni, chats with students. So if you want maybe a more personal um, or smaller event as well, there will be opportunities for that as well. But I hope this has been inspiring for you. I hope that this gives you the confidence to approach the application um, and share your story, share your experiences. And hopefully Stanford is a place that you, you see yourself thriving in. And once again, thank you to our panelists. And I will say so long for now and hope to see you all at future events. Thank you.